couple of months ago, almost on the verge of despair as a coffeepreneur, I stumbled across an opportunity that saved me from what I now refer to as losing my religion. As an entrepreneur, I was asking myself the question, given the goals and objectives we've set out as an organization, are we really still authentic in achieving our goals? And having received my baptism by fire in the Kenyan coffee industry, I was desperately seeking that opportunity that would re help me regain my hope and help me still believe that we can still provide producers with sustainable livelihoods and remain profitable in an industry that is so cutthroat, capital intensive, and with so many hidden codes that you only slowly discover after you've lost some money. So I got an introduction to a group of producers in the Kenyan Rift Valley. And coupled with my sense of curiosity and adventure, we decided as an organization to embark on this adventure to innovate with this new group of producers, Kenyan style, of course. Now, I'm sure that when I talk about coffee producing uh, regions in Kenya, most of the room here is very familiar with central Kenya, and when I drop names like Nyeri, Odaya, Kirinyaga, we're all so familiar, most of us, with those names. But when I talk about Kab Ngetunyi, Kab Kiai, and Kip Kelion, I may draw a couple of blanks in the room because those are relatively, I would say, newer regions where there's an amazing coffee happening in those regions, but it's slowly getting to this market. Now, in this region, a group of men came up with the model and decided to approach both the local government, a developmental organization, and private sector to implement this idea that they had. Now, these men decided to empower their wives. They decided that they wanted to give a couple of coffee bushes to their wives and in turn also get this coffee certified and find perhaps new alternatives to what has been a cycle that is really not making sense to them, the ordinary um, market to which they're selling their coffee currently. Now, a couple of statistics on land ownership in Kenya. Now, in Kenya currently, 5% of land is owned jointly by husband and wife. 1% is owned by women. And the other 94% is wholly owned by men. Now, in Kenya as well, 32% of households are headed by women, mine included, and 68% of households are jointly run by husband and wife. Now, the ownership of assets is not just important to that smallholder farmer. Asset ownership is crucial for any person venturing into business or when you're an adult. And I can tell you that when you don't own assets, there are various hurdles that will be difficult for you to jump as a business person, um, as any individual. Because if your husband does not sign on that dotted line or your significant other or your parents, then uh, you'll miss out on certain opportunities in you know, developing yourself as a person. So this goes to show you how unique this model is, especially in a society that is so patriarchal. Now, other objectives that were part of this project were to develop biogas units for the different uh, women's groups. So we worked on developing 400 biogas units, 290 for the Kabngetunyi women and 110 for the other group of women. And of course, this has helped improve various environmental factors, there's green energy, and the farmers now have diversified in the farming methods and are earning an extra income through all of this. I'd like to take a moment and focus a little about the word that we sometimes throw around, value addition at origin. 
Now, why is this crucial? We have to learn to tell our own stories, not just in this scenario, but whether you're a country, an individual, a business. If you do not own your story and your narrative is told by someone else, you lose your power. Value addition at origin is not only crucial to these farmers simply because it's another revenue stream, it is important because it now gives them the power to negotiate when they are dealing with buyers who want to come you know, buy the green coffee. And value addition is not simply sourcing quality coffee, roasting it, and taking it to market through the various distribution channels. When we were working on this project, it took us time to work on the branding and marketing of these two brands. And on the 1st and 2nd of February this year, we managed to launch Zawadi Coffee, which is a certified women's coffee, the first of its kind in Africa, a coffee that is actually owned by women. When I talk about ownership, you can trace this coffee right down to the farms. The coffee is processed separately from the men's coffee, and it is certified separately from the men's coffee. And we also helped to launch Kipkelion Union Coffee, which is a coffee, the first value-add coffee for the farmers in this region. The branding and marketing exercise, for those of you who are familiar with branding, I mean, it's an exercise that is very intense. Um, so the farmers had to be taken through the training as to why perhaps we chose the names. The name Zawadi uh, basically means gift in Swahili, given that the husbands gifted the women um, uh, the coffee bushes. And today, I'm happy to uh, let you know that you can enjoy the Great Rift Valley in your cup. Now, during, uh, this, um, during the launch, one of the, the major historical things that we witnessed was, for the first time, smallholder farmers were getting to taste coffee. For the first time, smallholder farmers got to taste a cappuccino, a latte. For the first time, the smallholder farmer that toils day in, day out, with meager resources and various obstacles, got to appreciate the final fruits of their labor. And for the first time, they were getting to even see an espresso machine and understand what the, you know, when they're told produce an 86 plus coffee or when someone, when a buyer comes and says, I want this kind of coffee. For the first time, they were getting to appreciate, you know, the lingo that is, you know, with the coffee sector. Now, during uh, this project, of course, there's been various obstacles that we've come across. There's been a lot of cynicism. Um, and there's been people, I mean, there's been men within these um, communities who have started feeling disempowered. And these are questions we have to ask ourselves, both as private sector and the, the de developmental world, that when we talk about empowerment, what, do we, what does empowerment look like for both the communities and for us as the investors in these communities. But what we have seen despite these obstacles is a project that has been successful, a project that can actually be replicated in other coffee growing regions. The simple act of choosing to cooperate with another individual, that simple act of choosing trust over cynicism, of choosing generosity over selfishness lights up the mind with quiet joy. And what better project to cooperate with or to cooperate on than trying to improve the world that we live in for all of us. However, I have to talk about the paradox that comes with the word empowerment. When you're entering into a partnership where there may be a shift in the power balance. It becomes a relationship like that of a parent and a child. As a parent, you are trying to create an independent child. Your child may end up not seeing the world the same way that you do. Now, if we're to move away from the notion of colonial development, 
we must learn to take very high risks. And these risks involve, you know, putting up with um, results that may, you may not have envisioned. When we are going into these communities talking about empowerment and when you empower them and you still want to exercise control, that is the wrong way of going about this whole exercise of empowerment. We have to learn to let go. You have to learn to let things grow. And when your time is done with a community, you have to perhaps step back and watch it flourish. I find that there's this paradox between the definition of what we as investors, whether we are the developmental world or the private sector viewers, what is good for us, but we forget to factor in when you empower these communities, what should it look like for them? We have witnessed several times at Origin where people pull the plug on projects simply because things may not be going, and maybe the, the group that you've empowered is, is all of a sudden seeking different buyers or they're looking for other certifications and things like that. They, well, you empowered them, so... And that's what empowerment, uh, you know, looks like. Now, I'd like for us to take a moment and imagine that we're all individual coffee beans. In Kenyan terms, there's 43 million coffee beans. 80% of these coffee beans are under the age of 35. Now, the problem with this 80% is that they're all fighting for the same water source. Now, growing up, myself and other young people grew up with the mentality that success is defined by money. Getting a corporate job, getting married, having kids, moving up the ladder, getting into retirement, and that cycle repeats itself. I live in a country where the unemployment rate is currently at 40%. Now, what if this 40% ventured into uncharted territories, decided to create their own land where they sought out other options? Now, with projects like what we've carried out, when we practically introduced or demystified the coffee chain to young people in these regions, we discovered that a lot of them had an interest in actually joining the coffee sector. Finally, they understood that coffee isn't just farming. You don't have to get into the coffee sector to take over your parents' property or your parents' land. You can become a queue grader. You can become a barista. You can become a trader. You can become an entrepreneur. Now, these are options which, for many folks at Origin, a lot of young people don't get to hear this. And it is important for them to understand that there are options. And for anyone who has lived in a poor community, they understand and, the, and they know that the most crippling effect of unemployment is the loss of self-esteem. And no matter what any economist will tell you, the purpose of business is to create self-esteem. So my concern is the future. How do we guarantee the next generation, our children, that indeed businesses can be both socially and, and environmentally conscious? Now, today, an ambitious and passionate duo that is a Colombian and a Kenyan came together and decided to start something that matters. After a lot of restlessness with the status quo and what the industry has become, we decided to radicalize and to try and decommoditize the coffee industry for the better of the next generation. Now, more than a decade ago, when I got into this industry and I decided to go back home, I went back home with a singular resolve to try and create change and to positively disrupt the sector and try and just provide a new way to look at things. You know, despite 
the corruption and the fear and the poverty that I saw back home, I still saw smiles. What I saw were people that wanted their lives changed, but they didn't have a voice. And today, I am here to share some of those stories with you. But this doesn't have to end here. I would like for all of us to look at the people in your lives. The people who perhaps have fallen on the wrong soil and need some nourishment. I encourage you to nourish them in one way or another, be it with education, be it with economic empowerment, be it with love. Then the dreams that we all imagine can be dreams that become a reality. I want us to collaborate in one way or another and invest in the future of women and youth. Thank you.